Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Show here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia. And as always, it is an honor and a privilege to have you guys joining me here today on this glorious Thursday, which is technically, I mean, officially the 17th is the opening day of Justice League, but really it opens nationwide in theaters everywhere today. So I'm so glad you guys are here and joining me to be a part of the show today. Got a whole bunch of stuff, some very interesting things to go about. And today's lessons is even a freaking nobody can be somebody on the internet, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, I'll get to what I mean by that in just a second. All right, here's how today's show is going to go, guys. I got picked out five topics that you guys have sent in to me. Now, how do you get a topic or a question on the John Campia show? It's simple. You just email me anytime at john at the john show.com that's john at the john show.com make sure you put the word topic in the subject line once again make sure you put that word topic in the subject line or else i'm not going to see your email and also guys make sure to keep your emails to 90 words or less because if it's any longer than that i'm not even going to bother reading it because i wouldn't even be able to fit it on the screen even if i wanted to then after that, I'm going to go to the live viewers for those of you guys who are watching live. And I'm going to take live questions and topics and comments from you guys that you will simply tweet into me at John Campy. Don't send those in yet. Wait till closer to the end of the show before we get to that. So with all of that out of the way, let's get on to the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Sharuk Ali, who writes, My question is is how can the studios release films that have seemingly incomplete or poor CGI? Is it because they have a deadline to keep, or they ran out of budget, or simply they haven't noticed it? If people like you and I can see it's poor CGI work, how come the experts in studios are comfortable in releasing films like that? Okay, here's the thing. Um, this brings up actually a much bigger topic. And, and obviously this is a situation that's come up a lot because of Justice League. And one of the big things coming out of Justice League is there's a lot of bad CGI. Look, I saw Justice League for the second time last night. I'm going to go see it for a third time tonight. I actually liked it even a little bit more the second time I saw it. But what still stood out to me is bad CGI. The CGI is bad. In particular, this guy. This guy, he looks like an NPC character in a cutscene in World of Warcraft. That's that's how he comes across animation-wise. Um, so that was bad, and there's a lot of other bad things about it, but whatever. To me, the good outweighs the bad with Justice League. I had a good time with it. Again, I'm going to go see it for a third time tonight. Anyway, so that's got a lot of people asking me, how can bad CGI slip through the cracks like that? How can bad CGI get to... Uh, on screen. And this led to a, this whole topic led to a little bit of drama with me yesterday. I'll share that drama with me that happened yesterday, which was my own bloody fault, which is always the worst. I mean, when crap happens to you, it's always great when you can blame somebody else, but then you realize it was your own bloody fault. And then you just, ah, damn, I'm really an idiot anyway, but I'll get to that in a second. So here's the thing about the CGI with, uh, in particular justice league. Now with movies as a whole, yeah, there are time limitations. There are budget limitations. Hopefully you've planned in advance the money you need and you know to work within the budget that you have and you learn to work within the time strengths you have. And every once in a while, bad CGI still comes through. It happens. But for a movie like Justice League, let's not pretend that Justice League is just like any other movie. Let's remember this. Justice League has gone through a lot of upheaval, especially in the director's chair position. All right? Because we all know back in May which was, was, was still six months away from the movie, Zack Snyder had to get up and leave because of personal horrible tragedy. Then Joss Whedon comes in, and he's got six months. And if it was just six months to just put on the finishing touches like a lot of people like to believe, that's probably fine. But look, we all know that the reshoots and the like reorganization of the film was far more massive than they let on. Okay, all the trades reported at Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, everybody reported it. Warner Brothers did the right thing. They put on the PR thing. Oh, no, it's just minor little things. It was major reshoots. And you'll see for yourself when you see the movie. So essentially, Zack Snyder didn't have the full thing to complete the movie he wanted. Joss Whedon comes in. He's got six months to, some would say, it's an even harder thing to do, which is kind of like retool practically the whole thing, reshoot a lot of it, rearrange the movie, and and then you got to do all the post-production, and you got six months. Forget two years, you got six months. So it is an unusual circumstance for everybody. 
And that's why to me, even though, you know, I said in my review, and hopefully you guys saw my review of Justice League, I said in my review, yeah, the, the, there's bad CGI. There's some really bad CGI in the film. There's some, some very good CGI, but there's also some bad CGI. But I didn't get upset about it. And maybe I should have talked about that in my in my review, but I didn't get upset. It's like, there's no, you know, how dare Warner Brothers put out a sloppy thing like this with CGI. I didn't get upset about it because I know that, hey, look, Snyder left. He didn't get to finish. Joss Whedon came in. He had six months to do a monumental task as well as his entire crew. There are extenuating circumstances that made me go, okay, it's unfortunate that there's some bad CGI in this film. It did take away from the film a little bit, but I get it. I mean, and one of the things I did say in my review is that the one mistake I think Warner Brothers made in this was, I told you two months ago, there were discussions going on at Warner Brothers about pushing Justice League into 2018. And I get why they wouldn't. I mean, it would be a PR nightmare. So I get it. I do. I still think they probably should have pushed into 2018 to give Joss Whedon and the crew and everybody a little bit more time to get exactly what they wanted. Because at some point you run out of time. Well, anyway, this leads in to my personal story about this whole fiasco I found myself in yesterday. And I got nobody to blame but myself for this. So here's the thing. So I'm sitting down watching TV with Anne, right? And as we do watching TV, commercial breaks, you check your phone, see if there's any messages, blah, blah, some new tweets. And just for days, I've been seeing these tweets and these messages. Well, just screw Zack Snyder if the CGI is bad. Oh, Zack Snyder doesn't know to do good CGI. Or uh, on the other side, people, Joss Whedon blew the CGI and blah, blah, blah. And of course, remember in the back of my head, it's like, look, there are a lot of extenuating circumstances with this. It's not just Zack Snyder. It's not just uh, Joss Whedon. There are teams and scores of people, visual effects teams, everybody. They all had their backs against the wall. I mean, this isn't on any one person. That's what's in my head, right? So I hop on Twitter to basically say, hey guys, look, Zack Snyder doesn't do, at least this is what I think I'm tweeting. Zack Snyder doesn't do CGI. Zack Snyder doesn't sit down and do the rotoscoping. He doesn't do the compositing. He doesn't do the, the, the character rigging or anything like that. Joss Whedon doesn't go in there and he doesn't hop on Maya or Lightwave or whatever piece of software they're using these days. I mean, I think it's changed a lot since I was in it, but he's not doing it. Look, they got VFX teams. They got whatever. So I get some people starting to tweet me and some of you know what I'm talking about. So some people start to tweet back to me debating whether or not the visual effects are always the director's fault. And I'm, I'm having some good debate with people. Like it was good. It was civil. It was good debate. Some people getting their, their uh, knickers in a twist, but that's fine, whatever. And so finally, then what it comes down to, well, on top of all that, I get, I suddenly start getting tweets and I get tweets from like, um, like James Gunn director of Guardians of the Galaxy and one of the most underrated films of all time, Slither. And you know, I've had James Gunn in my studio before. I, I have a big fan of James Gunn. So James Gunn tweets to me. Oh, that's the wrong one. Here it goes. James Gunn tweets to me and he writes, Hey John, a good director oversees every single VFX shot again and again. The director has as much say in the quality, the artistry and the consistency between vendors along with editing a film. It is the primary job of a director in a post heavy film. Of course, of which I don't disagree with him at all. I mean, absolutely. Remember, I worked in the VFX industry for a while. He's totally right. And I respond to him. Yeah, but I mean, sometimes you run out of time and sometimes you run out of money and whatever, right? And then Seth Rogen tweets at me. So Seth Rogen gets on Twitter and he goes, dude, this is bullshit. It's completely the director's fault often. And then he writes, VFX are a tool like anything else. And if a director can't use it properly, it's no different than being able to use the camera properly or the actors properly. And of course, he's absolutely right. And I like, I tweet back, it's like, hey, all I'm saying is that it's not the director's fault all the time. Like even Seth said, it's just often, and yes, quite often it's the director's. But then I get this guy on Twitter who responds to that and says, John, you said it's all the VFX people's fault. And I get upset at that because I hate it when people put words in my mouth, right? So <laughs> look, I'm going to warn you, like many stories, this story makes me look stupid. So I'm getting upset because I do not like it when people put words in my mouth. And I start to tweet back to this guy saying, I never said that. And then I go to get my tweet so I can copy and paste it and say, this is exactly what I said. But then I look at the tweet and the way I worded it and what I sent out. And this is what I actually tweeted. I tweeted, remember folks, don't blame the director for bad CGI. That's on the, and this is the line. That's on the VFX team. The director doesn't sit there and model animate Roto. They have VFX companies and teams that do that, blah, blah, blah. But the big line there is, 
That's on the VFX team. So here I am getting ready to tear this dude a new one saying, I never said that. Don't put words in my mouth. And then I go back and look at my tweet and I'm like, God damn it. I did say that. And like, again, it was one of those situations where I'm just sitting there watching TV, checking my phone and then tweet something out, whatever. And you know, it's whatever. Look, I'm a freaking nobody from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. That just happens to be living in LA, but I am a nobody. And it's still surreal to me that I can put out a tweet and then I can have like some of my favorite directors, like James Gunn, Seth Rogen, and other people writing to me. But here's the thing that that's on me. That is all my fault. I, I worded that wrong. That is not the intent I had for my tweet at all. Again, like I didn't do a lot of heavy visual effects work. Most of the work I did in the visual effects industry was, I mean, I did a little bit of the, of the carryover work because we were a small visual effects company. But my, mainly my job was to be the client services. I would be the go-between between what the client needed, make sure, making sure our artists knew what was going on. I sat there when our artists were working 36 hours straight, only taking breaks to run to the bathroom and do a quick 10-minute run to 7-Eleven so they can get a Slurpee and a bag of Doritos, sleeping on the floor of the offices, busting their asses to get things done. And I'm very well aware of the current status of the VFX industry. So as somebody who has worked in that environment, I was mortified to see that I wrote that line. This is on the VFX team because that is not how I intended it. And I'm an idiot and I should have been far more careful about that. And I even had a friend of mine who's also in VFX who knows how much I revere VFX artists who write to me and goes, John, you didn't really mean this, right? I'm like, no, I didn't. That was a stupid thing. And you know what? I thought about pulling my tweet down, but I thought, you know what? No, I put it out there like that. I need to own up to it. I'm going to leave the tweet up and just own up to it. It's like, that was on me. That was my bad. So, but it's funny that I'm sitting there last night. It's like, why the hell is Seth Rogen tweeting me? But anyway, uh, good on them. So, but it comes back to my main point though, is that even uh, and later James Gunn acknowledged that, yeah, sometimes, you know, even directors, you run out of time, you want, you run out of resources. And I think that's a situation with Justice League. That's the bottom line here is I think that is the situation with Justice League that they ran out of time. They ran out of resources. They were up against the wall. I think Warner Brothers should have given them more time by pushing it into 2018, given the circumstances. And I understand they were worried about fan backlash, but I think you and I as fans, I think we would have understood. Look, if Warner Brothers came out and said, hey, look, due to this horrible tragedy that happened with Zack's family, it really threw a wrench because it wasn't like he was just another actor in the film. It's the director of the film. And it really threw a wrench in our things. We feel like to do the movie justice, no pun intended, to do the movie justice, we feel like we we need to push the release date and given them more time to do what they needed to do. And that's what I think they should have done. And that's why this happens sometimes. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. It went off longer on that than I should have, but whatever. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters. I love my Patreon supporters. Um, one of my Patreon supporters, Anrag P, who writes, big fan since the AMC days. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if you've been the most, re if you've seen the most recent trailer of the new Brie Larson movie, Bas uh, Basmati Blues. But the trailer as a whole really gave off the impression of another white person trying to come to India to save it while playing on common Indian stereotypes. As an Indian myself, it is increasingly frustrating to, to uh, seeming so, or seeing, I think they meant, so many Indian actors being typecast or Indian culture being used in such a fashion. Well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Anrag. And you know what? I had seen that the trailer for this had come out, I think it came out like a month ago, but I remembered, you reminded me, I never got around to watching it, so I watched it. Now look, I think you raise a very valid concern and a very valid issue. Let me start off by saying, in case you haven't noticed, I am a white dude. <laughs> so I'm a white dude, so my, um, my barometer and my cultural sensitivity is skewed towards me being a white dude which means I don't fully appreciate what somebody outside of my living experience, how they perceive things, how it impacts them in a very real and, and, and tangible way. It's outside of maybe even my ability to be able to understand that. So I'm gonna give you my opinion on this, but remember it's coming from somebody who admittedly is a white dude that doesn't fully understand or grasp the way I should, the way other people from other backgrounds may view certain sets of material when it hits me a certain way. So just let me admit that right up front, okay? I, I watched Basmati Blues, the trailer, after reading your email, and I was expecting to see some really horrible white savior stuff in there. My, the way I perceived it, and again, my perception is skewed because I'm a white dude in North America. 
Um, but I'm just going to be honest and let's, this honesty is a good place to start the discussion. So when I watched the trailer, my impression of it was I didn't get a sense of white savior. I got a sense of a Brie Larson character being a fish out of water. And like what some American movies have done before is American goes into a different culture and they teach that culture the truth and value of the American way. Like you don't drink beer and watch football. The American comes in and teaches them to appreciate football and rock and roll and apple pie, right? So that's what I was kind of expecting to see in this trailer after I saw your email. What I saw, again, from my very skewed perspective, was a movie about Brie Larson, who herself was the fish out of water, not teaching the other culture how to be American. <clears throat> Pardon me. Not teaching the other culture how to be American, but rather the opposite. That she was having her stereotypes and her understandings of another culture change, and that that culture started to have an impact and effect on her rather than the other way around. Usually in a lot of these American white savior movies, it's the other way around. It's the Americans showing the other culture how to be more American, right? This was, to me, it, I perceived it as being the other way around. And it wasn't her, it wasn't some white girl coming in and saving this culture from their own problems. It was this white girl coming in and then as an insider, trying to correct something bad that a white company, that a, an American white dominated company was doing to them. And so, from my perspective, I watched it and I thought it was pretty good. But again, I mean, I, I'm not in your shoes, so I can totally understand why you would watch that and then have a different perception. I can say I thought it was rather refreshing that it wasn't Brie Larson going in there to show India how to be more American and how American ways are better than Indian ways and blah, blah, blah. I actually got the opposite from the trailer. I felt like it was the culture that was changing her. And that she, as an insider, was simply standing up to her own people who were trying to do something bad to this community that she was living in. Again, that's just the way I saw it. Uh, and again, I, I come from an admittedly skewed perspective of pale, pasty white skin. Um, but listen, maybe you guys have had a chance to see uh, Basmati Blues, the trailer for it at any rate. Jump into the comments section and let me know what you guys think about that. Okay, let's move on. Okay, there's some real idiots uh, in the chat board that I'm just going to get rid of here quickly. Okay. Anyway, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic today, hold on a second, let me move on from this. The next topic today comes to us from Alejandro Alonso, who writes, Hey, John, it has been the case that a lot of Marvel movies have had bad villains, but great hero development. Critics usually like those movies enough to give them a fresh review on Rotten Tomatoes. We've been hearing similar comments about Justice League. If it turns out that this movie gets a rotten, is there a case to be made that there is a negative bias around Warner Brothers or a positive one around Marvel? Uh, thanks a lot for the question, man. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And here's why. I get frustrated with the amount of, of um, like, there are some people out there, and look, we all do it. And it's not even just Marvel or just DC fans. It's Power Rangers fans. It's Star Wars fans. It's Rambo fans. It's whatever. We all do this, okay? This is all of us. We all do this. That when somebody or a group of people don't like something we like, we don't know how to handle that. So we to try to come up with excuses for why somebody else didn't like what we like. Instead of just saying, oh, they didn't like it because it didn't work for them. Instead of doing that, we come up with excuses. There's bias. Critics are paid off. There's blah. Like we, that's what we do. We do that. Sports fans do that. I mean, every, we all do. It's part of one of the rotten things about being human, I guess. So anyway, but I've been seeing a lot of people's like, people criticizing just because there's a weak story. Well, well, Thor had a weak story and they're saying it's fine. Well, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Like, for some critics, that you might say the, the story in Thor Ragnarok was weak, but to a lot of critics, maybe the story worked for them, and it wasn't weak. Just because you thought it was weak, doesn't mean it was weak. Just because I think it's weak, doesn't mean it's weak. It's going to hit everybody in a different way. There's no need to come up with excuses. Now, as far as Marvel villains go, number one, Marvel does get a lot of crap all the time for weak villains. They get it all the time. You hear me talking about it all the time. I hear all types of critics always talking about the weak nature of the villains. But here's the big difference. While Marvel does have, and this is just from my perspective, while Marvel does have a Malekith, right? Bad villain. 
bad villain in Thor The Dark World. Okay. Most of the Marvel villains haven't been bad. They've just been weak. And there is a difference between a weak villain and a bad villain. Like, for instance, Yellow Jacket in Ant-Man. He wasn't a bad villain. It's just that it, it was a weak villain. They hardly spent much time on him. He only popped up when they needed him to further Paul Rudd's Ant-Man story. There, he wasn't fleshed out that much. But, I mean, he was fine. The, the character itself was fine. There was nothing wrong with him. It's just that it was a weak villain because it's hardly used. And they only use him to further the hero's journey story. So it's weak. Um, I'm forgetting the name of uh, Mads Mikkelsen's character in Doctor Strange. Not a bad villain, no. But hardly any time is spent on him. He was a, he was a weak villain. It's not fleshed out. They really don't spend much time on the villain himself to let him become a three-dimensional character. They just use their villain to propel along the hero's journey for the hero. It's a weak villain. But it's not a bad villain. Malekith was a bad one, but for the most part, Marvel villains, from my perspective, have not been bad. They've been perfectly fine villains, it's just that they've been completely underused and they're weak. I mean, you get the odd exception. Obviously, Loki is one they've used quite well. Uh, I'm sure they've had one or two others. They did a much better job with Michael Keaton's Vulture villain. They spent more time on him. They go into his family background. They, they do better things with him in Spider-Man Homecoming, but for the most part, they don't use their villains much and hence they're weak. Steppenwolf is a bad villain, all right? I mean, he's a weak villain too, just like Marvel villains. They, they hardly touch him except for when he's there to punch somebody in the face. But he's a bad villain, in my opinion. At any rate, you may watch it and think differently. You may think Steppenwolf is a great villain when you see the movie. That's awesome. I celebrate that with you. But that doesn't mean that I have a bias. That doesn't mean I've been paid off by somebody. That just means, okay, you saw it and you thought he was a good villain, great. I saw it, thought it was a bad villain, fine. So the, the oversimplicity of people saying, well, that movie had a weak story and they're giving it a hard time. Well, not all weak stories are equal. Some movie might have a weak story, but it's a little bit weak. Another movie might have just a rotten, horrible story that is terrible. You can't just say, well, they both had weak stories, so they should be rated equal. That's, that's not how it works. So anyway, that's, that's just my thought on, on that particular topic. And I know most of you are wondering, uh, are they're sitting there screaming at the screen, John, get to the Batman thing. Just one more question to go through until we get to the Batman issue. And the next question comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters, Alan Dale, who writes, Hey, John, when you talk about all-time highest box office grossing movies, why isn't adjusted for inflation taken into account? Surely the box office is based on the number of actual tickets sold per film. I'm sure um, the all-time top 10 list of films would look very different. Can you, <laughs> Can you please explain this as it's always puzzled me? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, yeah, there, look, here's, there are a number of factors that go into like understanding box office, right? One of those factors is inflation. You know, what somebody paid for a $5 movie ticket in 1980, $5 is worth something different today, so maybe we should take inflation into account since that's an extenuating circumstance. And I hear that a lot. Here's the problem, and here's how it's been explained to me, and I agree with this 100%. Now, first let me say there's no perfect way to do it. I think we will all agree there is no perfect way to do it. But here's the problem. Inflation isn't the only extenuating circumstance. Inflation isn't the only variable factor that we can take into consideration if we want. Inflation is just one. So the question is, why would we pick inflation as a variable factor and not take the other variable and factors? We either, it seems to me that we either have to just go, hey, pure number, it's not perfect, but go pure number, box office, go. Or... It seems we have to take 10 or 11 variable factor extenuating circumstances into consideration, not just the one being inflation. Because you can say, but John, you know, with inflation prices, if you take that in consideration and, you know, cross-reference that and extrapolate that over time, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, you could do that. But then I would make the argument and what theater chains say, well, they have to make the argument is that, well, then you have to take in consideration number of movies that came out. Because, like, for instance, in the 1950s, not nearly as many feature-length, wide-release films came out as come out today. Far more competition exists today. Far more night and day difference competition today. Do we take that in consideration? You know, back in 1960s, there weren't, there wasn't an, this entire huge entertainment industry known as gaming. 
there wasn't this huge, you know, competitor for the entertainment dollar that didn't even exist in 1960. But that big major competition for your entertainment dollar gaming does exist today. Do we take that in consideration? What about this? What about that? What about cost of running theaters? What about budgets of the movies? Should all these things to be taken into consideration to come up with some really big convoluted mathematical formula? And what the industry has basically decided is, you know what, that's all a convoluted mess. The best way, imperfect as it is, the best way to do it is to take all those variable factors out and just go with the pure numbers. Because if we bring in one variable factor, then we have to consider other variable factors and then it becomes really messy. So it has always been this way. I'm comfortable with it being this way. I'm not saying there's not a better way out there, but it seems to me that this is the least imperfect one. They're all imperfect ideas and options. This to me seems like the least imperfect one. All right, now I'm going to go on to the final email question today, and then I'm going to do my little commercial break, and then I'm going to throw it over to you guys who are watching live. And the final email question today comes to us from Francisca Ramirez, who writes... Ben being done as Batman seems like a foregone conclusion at this point. Is Matt Reeves is still, is Matt Reeves is still working? I think the price is if Matt Reeves is still working on a standalone Batman film, or would that be canceled if Affleck walks? Now, in Francisca's uh, defense, she actually wrote that email prior to yesterday's show. I think she wrote that email on Tuesday or something. But anyway, so um, as you guys know, yesterday I mentioned on the show that I spoke to a couple of people who told me who uh, Matt Reeves is looking at and wants as Batman. Now, before I reveal the name, let me give a couple of disclaimers, okay? One of the two people um, who told me about this is one of the same three people who all the way back at the beginning of the year told me Ben Affleck was out as Batman, all right? And that, obviously, that worked, that was true. Um, it's also important to note, some people saying, I'm getting tired of seeing Ben Affleck go back and forth. Look, behind the scenes, Ben Affleck's not going back and forth. This thing about Ben Affleck leaving, this was decided in like February. This was decided at the beginning of the year. This has been a foregone conclusion forever. They've just been putting on PR spin. All right. Not that it couldn't change behind the scenes, but the, the decision was made forever ago. Um, anyway, so I had this one friend of mine uh, who is, uh, who's, uh, influential person in Hollywood, tell me who it was. And so I took that and reached out to this one guy who was one of the people who told me about Ben Affleck uh, back in the day. And I said, hey, this is the name I'm being told. Any validity to this? And he told me, yep. Yeah. Now, here's one of the big differences though. With the Ben Affleck thing, it wasn't even a question. It was, it's done. Ben Affleck is out. Ben Affleck's out as Batman. It's done. Uh, I mean, you're not going to hear anything about it till after Justice League comes out because that would be a PR nightmare for Justice League. So they're going to put on a PR spin and everything. But at the time, it was that. It's different this time. Like with the Ben Affleck thing, it was, oh, no, it's done. It's not a question. It, it's done. This is a little bit different. He says, yes, that is the name that was floated. There has been some conversations, but it's not a sure thing that this is happening. It's not a lock. It may not happen at all, blah, blah, blah. So it's a very different scenario than when he told me about Ben Affleck. It's a very different one, but still. So who's the name? Uh, here it is. And actually, you know what? Somebody in the chat board nailed it. It's this guy, Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh, not a name I would have suspected, not a name that I would have uh, thought, probably not the first one that I would have gone with, but you know what? When you think about it, it makes perfect sense. The other thing that I have been told, because this fits in with it, Jake is about nine years younger than Ben Affleck. And from what I understand, Matt Reeves's Batman is either just gonna completely ignore the DCEU, probably not, or set it before the events of Batman versus Superman. Jake Gyllenhaal, I believe, is 36 years old, which makes him nine years younger than Ben. So there's a little bit more flexibility there. You can go a little bit more prequel, and then you can fast forward and put some fake beard. I, I'm just now I'm just speculating about well, maybe they'll put gray in his beard. I whatever. Now I'm just speculating on that point. But here's one of the things: if this works out, um, this is this is magnificent. Like you all know how I feel about Ben Affleck as Batman. I've gone on ad nauseum. A uh, Ben. Ben will always be right here for me. I love Ben. But I think if you're a DC fan, if you're a comic book movie fan, the concept, the idea 
of like one of the, I think everybody would probably agree. Jake is a top 10, like best actors in the world right now. I mean, can you, this dude who played Nightcrawler, and by the way, right now he's jacked. Like, like he is in the best shape of his life right now. So he is completely jacked. Um, I, I think that if this works out, th I think that's wonderful. I think it's absolutely freaking wonderful. Not that Ben won't be there. You know, I'm heartbroken about that. But since that's already pretty much done, if it turns out that Jake Gyllenhaal is the guy, I think it's magnificent. I think it would be magnificent. Now, again, I cannot stress enough from what I've been told. Uh, there have been some talks, there have been some discussions, nothing's done, nothing is guaranteed that this is happening whatsoever. Let's be very, very clear about that. But yeah, I have heard from multiple sources. And as a matter of fact, I got an email about 20 minutes before I, uh, I went on air here today. Let me, oh yeah, it was, uh, Rick, um, who is, runs another entertainment website. I'm not going to give any more names because I don't know if he wants me sharing the name, but about half hour before the show today. Rick emails me because I put up that I was going to reveal who they were talking about for, ben, for, for Batman. And he wrote to me and he actually said, he goes, I actually have a source who says this name. Is this the name? And I'm like, oh my God, like he, he nailed it. He totally nailed it. So uh, Rick, uh, you got it. You nailed it. Uh, it. It was him as a matter of fact. So that's the name I've been hearing. So the big question now becomes, what do you think about that? Do you like the idea of Jake Gyllenhaal? Or do you love him enough as an actor? Do you like him enough as an actor? Do you think, do you like the idea of him? And if what I'm hearing is true, and I don't know if what I'm hearing is true about the time frame, but if what I'm hearing is true about a time frame about a standalone Batman's being set before Batman versus Superman, does that excite you? Does it not excite you? But really the, the whole concept of, of uh, Jake Gyllenhaal as the actor. Does that excite you? Let me know in the comments section below. All right, guys. Now, I know you guys are going to have a ton of things you want to say. For those of you who are watching live, there's like over 2,000 of you guys in the live chat board right now. So I'm going to do this. Let me take my daily little commercial break here. This is about one minute long. Plugging the only reason my entire show is even possible is my Patreon supporters. Let me plug that and we'll be right back to take your live questions. Let's do it. For those of you who have followed me for any period of time, you guys know that I made the decision recently to leave the corporate overlords. I no longer wanted to work for corporations. I wanted to be an independent content creator. And the only way I've been able to do that is by the support of my Patreon supporters. So what I would like to do is to ask you guys who watch my shows, who spend any amount of time with me every single month, to consider going over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. There you'll get all the information about what exactly does it mean to be a Patreon supporter of mine? What does being a Patreon supporter do for helping to make sure that shows like this one and all the other shows I do here on my channel can actually be produced? And on top of that, what benefits are there to being a Patreon supporter? And maybe if you guys can check that out, if you decide you want to be one of my Patreon supporters, that would be awesome. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine too. I'm just happy that you guys have decided to be here today and be a fellow movie fan and join us in the conversation. So go and check out the website, see if you want to become a Patreon supporter. And now let's get back. All right. And I, sorry, I was uh, kind of caught doing something there. Freeze frame. So uh, thank you so much to all you guys who are already my Patreon supporters. You guys make this show possible. Okay, let's move on now to your guys' live tweets. Once again, simply tweet to me. And guys, make sure you're following me on Twitter as well. Tweet to me at John, John, <laughs> at John Campy. All right, let's get on to the first tweet today. And the first tweet today coming to us from Elijah, 1989, 930, Rich, John. Do you think DC made a mistake not including Darkseid in Justice League, at least in a post credit scene? Nope, nope. <clears throat> It would have felt forced to me, to be honest with you. I think um, I think it was the right decision. I really do. And, you know, it goes along. I still think the two-hour runtime was the perfect runtime because the, crip pa the crisp pace and that lean cadence to the movie forced the attention to be on the strengths of the film. I feel like had they made the movie longer, it just would have accentuated the weaknesses of the film. And I think part of leaving Darkseid out of that contributed to that crisp pace, that lean feel to the movie, focusing on the strengths of the movie, which are the characters and their chemistry together. So, yeah, I, I think it was the right move. Honestly, I really do. Uh, this one comes to us from Ari Grande Poops, who writes, John, which post, which post Toy Story 3 Pixar film do you like more, Inside Out or Coco? My review for Coco is up right now. You know what? I'm going to lean Coco. 
It's, and I had I had a little bit of doubts about Coco, I admit. But it's a real special movie. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Um, let's see. Let's go to this one. Um, Disgusted Pigs writes, John, you allow misdirect uh, misdirecting ads, but dislike t- uh, Tatum Kingsman 2 ones. What of twists as in Psycho? How do you allow for those? Well, look, if you're talking about the difference, I don't allow for misleading ads misdirection and misleading are two different things. Like with Star Wars, what we're seeing last shot, I believe there's a lot of misdirection. But with Kingsman 2, that movie led you to believe that Channing Tatum was a major character in the movie. That Channing, T- Channing Tatum's like 80% of the trailer. And like, he's in five minutes of the movie. It, that's, a, that's misleading. That's not a misdirect. That's misleading. That's a flat out lie. With Star Wars The Last Jedi and some other movies, like, look, they're not misleading. They're not misleading us about everything. We know Rey is a major character in the film. We know Kylo Ren's a major character in the film. We know Luke's a major character in the film. And they might be misdirecting us a little bit about what might be happening in this scene, what might be happening in that scene. But that's a far cry from something like that or Mission Impossible 2. Mission Impossible 2, which made us think the ads for Mission Impossible 2 made us think that Anthony Hopkins was in the movie almost as much as Tom Cruise. And Anthony Hopkins is in two scenes in the movie. He's barely in the movie at all, but he's like, Tom Cruise, Anthony Hopkins, Mission Impossible 2. That's misleading. Misleading is like that Disney film, Bridge to Terabithia, where the entire trailers makes you think this is a fantasy movie with kids who discover a magic kingdom in the woods. But the movie is depressing. It's about a kid who dies and this other kid dealing with death and it's sad and depressing. And there were a lot of parents who were really pissed off at that because like you t- you made us think this was a fun fantasy family film. Instead, I got my little kid crying because I brought them to your movie. That's misleading. Misdirection and misleading are different. I'm perfectly fine with misdirection in trailers. I do not like misleading in trailer. To me, those are two different things. Um, let's see. This one comes to us from the Usman Alvi who writes, John, why would you cast American Indian actors to play Indians with an Indian accent in, for a film shot in India? I don't know. <laughs> look, I, look, I, look, bottom line for me, most of the time I don't care. Just get a really good actor. If you can find somebody of Indian descent who is a very good actor, trained here in Hollywood, so your director knows they can work with them better, and you can put them in the movie, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Honestly, maybe I shouldn't be fine with it. Maybe a year from now, I'll have a different opinion, and I'll be disgusted that I had this opinion for now. But honestly, it strikes me as fine, to be honest. It's the movies. It's make-believe. It's pretend. Um, Let's see. This one comes to us from Kevin Burney, who writes... um, Oh, I, I sorry, I, the, your question got cut off, so I can't even see what it says. Uh, let's let's try this one. This one comes to us from uh, Tilly Gilly writes, John, watching live from Australia, huge fan, simple question, Shrek 1 or Shrek 2? If Shrek 2 is the one with Neverland um, or, for, or Ever Afterland, what's it called in Shrek? I can't remember. I think Shrek 2. Shrek 2 is the one that I actually prefer more. That's the one I like even better. Uh, let's see. Here we go. This next one comes to us from Oh, Alex Simmons, who writes, Hey, John, with Star Trek Discovery season at the halfway point, I'd really like to watch a video on you dissecting it. Look, I, I, I don't know if I'll put together a full uh, a full video on it, but I've said from the beginning, I trashed on Star Trek Discovery before it aired. I said it was a stupid idea, never going to work, blah, 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 blah. What can I say? I got to call it like I see it. I really like it. I really like it. And um, I think it's a solid show. And maybe I'll do a mid-season review of it. So I'll think about it. Uh, let's see. This one comes to us from that Keith O'Neill says, John, if Jake Gyllenhaal rumor is true, when could we expect a formal announcement? Um, good question. Not for a little while yet. I would anticipate, um, justice league is just hitting theaters today. They're not going to want to have like Ben's officially out. They're not going to have, they're not going to officially acknowledge that yet. As a matter of fact, I won't be surprised if they deny it at least at first. Um, they'll deny it at first, whatever. And then we probably won't get an actual announcement until later on. And, and again, let me reemphasize the difference between the Ben Affleck situation, which the guy told me it's done deal. It's done. It's no questions. It's 100%. He's gone way back when to now is it's like, yeah, that's been the discussion, but nothing's happened as far as they know. Like for all I know, Jake Gyllenhaal has already signed on for all I know. He's already signed on for all I know. Those talks have already broken off. I'm not sure, but I can tell you that is who they were looking at at one point. Let's see if that actually carries through. 
Uh, let's see. Um, Maze219 writes, John, does Warner Brothers announce Jake as Batman at the same time as Ben out as Batman? Okay, so if it goes through, and if Jake Gyllenhaal is our new Batman, absolutely. And you know what? They'll continue what they've always done. They will PR spin it. They are never, at least not for a few more years, you're not going to hear anybody acknowledge that Ben was actually out back in February and March. You're not going to hear them admit that. What they're going to do is they're going to come up with another BS story. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is the right thing to do. This is why you have PR departments. But what they will do is they will come up with a story and say, oh, and it's going to be something like this. You know, Ben realizing with his schedule getting so full with other projects, he doesn't have the, enough time to properly dedicate to the Batman character that the Batman character deserves. So Ben has decided to step away so another actor can come in. And the funny thing is, there's going to be people out there who believe it. Like, just like, remember back, you know, Ben Affleck gets, I think it was, it was Jimmy Kimmel. Was that who he was on? Was it Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon? I can't remember. Maybe, let's go Jimmy Fallon. No, it's Jimmy Kimmel. Let's say he's on Jimmy Kimmel. And they ask him, hey, look, there are rooms going around. You might not direct the Batman movie. Are you? And Ben Affleck goes, no, I'm directing it. I'm directing Batman. It's the next movie I'm doing. The same month, the news drops that he's not directing it. And they put out this statement saying, oh, you know what? Ben just realized that, you know, directing Batman and being the star of Batman is too time consuming. He doesn't feel it'll be done. It'll do justice to the character. So he's going to step down as the director and just focus on acting as the character. And I said at the time, that's BS. And now we just get this comment from, remember, we talked about this the other day. Ben Affleck puts out the statement when somebody asks him, are you going to be the new Batman? He says, it's something I'm contemplating. Wait a minute. So we went from, oh, I'm so dedicated to playing Batman right that I got to step down as director to I'm contemplating being it. Come on. I mean, we all know what's going on now. So how they do it, I do suspect, though, yes, that if they announce Jake Gyllenhaal's Batman, it will be done probably in the same breath as they announced Ben Affleck stepping away, but they're going to make it sound like Ben Affleck is stepping away as a brand new decision. And oh, this, this just, we just realized Ben is getting so busy and he cares about the character so much. He needs somebody else to do it. And uh, no, none of that'll be true, but that is the way they'll probably spin it at any rate. Um, all right, guys, that will do it for me for today's installment of the John Campia show. Thank you so much for joining me. Listen, guys, while you're here, click the thumbs up button, leave a comment below. And remember, we're all film fans together, debate, discuss, argue, even that's the fun about being in a film fan, but just do so remembering that we're all film fans together. Ultimately, we're on the same team. So let's treat each other as such. That's really important. Again, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on social media, on Facebook, and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. That'll do it for me for now, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. And until the next time. Bye-bye.